Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Synergy Traders number 40, Investing and Long-Term Trading 2022 conference, brought to you by tradeoutloud.com and timingresearch.com. Um, I am recording each of the presentations individually, and those will be available on timingresearch.com permanently, as well as the timingresearch.com YouTube uh, channel and uh, uh, podcast channels as well. So all these presentations, of course, are for information and entertainment purposes only, and uh, trading involves a lot of risk. So be sure to check out the full policies and disclaimer at timingresearch.com slash policies. So today we have Jeff Wood of Traders Reserve doing our opening presentation for today. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are tuning in from. Um, first, I just want to say a quick thank you to David and the entire team for putting this uh, event on. I mean, this is number 40. It's incredible to see this event keep growing and growing. And actually, I was talking to David earlier about um, how I went to one of the earlier events. I don't know if it was number 20 or 13 or something like that. And uh, and I really wanted to be a presenter one day. And so now I'm kind of living out my dream here. So it's just, it's incredible to be with everyone here today. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me to kick off three days of fantastic speakers and presentations. You are going to learn so much over the next three days. I'm very excited for, for everyone here. Uh, as he said, my name is Jeff Wood, and uh, I get to chat with you guys for the next 50 minutes or so talking about the future of investing and one new market that has potential for explosive returns. I'm going to talk to you about a major market trend that we expect to see come to fruition over the next decade and why now is the time to enter. I also have Suzanne from the team. She's incredible. She's gonna be helping me out in the background, answering some questions, keeping me on task as I go through the presentation today. Um, so I'll try to get to all the questions that you have at the end, if you have any questions. All right, so who is ready to learn about the $8 trillion market and how you can be a part of it? Anyone, anyone at all? All right, let's get to this. So before we get too far, I know most of you probably don't recognize my name, and uh, that's me on the right with my dad. And uh, like it or not, I feature him at every speaking engagement because he's just been a large influence in my trading experience. Uh, this is, in fact, my first time, as I mentioned, uh, presenting at a Synergy Traders event. So those who don't know me, I am an editor at Traders Reserve, and for the most part, I conduct research looking at future market trends. And I have the great pleasure of sharing my findings in a couple of different newsletters presented by Traders Reserve. One of them is Wealthy Investors Society. That's a monthly newsletter where I get to look at companies and sectors that you may not be thinking about that uh, have potential for long-term growth. I'm also a research analyst for a newsletter, a monthly newsletter called Income Confidential that provides dividend and income investment ideas. I'm a contributing editor to Filthy Rich Dirt Poor. That's a daily newsletter where we provide forward analysis on what will impact the markets, keep you up to date on what you need to know to trade for that week. I'm a contributing, ed contributing editor to tradersreserve.com. But really, my trading experience comes from being a retail trader. I placed my first trade about 25 years ago, and I did what everyone did back then. I paid a whole lot in commissions. I think it was like $60 to place a trade. And I listened to a broker, and a broker gave me a recommendation, said, put your money here and wait seven years. Don't touch it, and it's going to double. And um, it, about two years later, I actually lost just about all of my money. And that really sort of launched my interest in the stock market. That's odd, right? I mean, I lost all my money, but I wanted to see where, I wanted to learn and see how I failed and to see if I could do better. So I started a trading, I started attending trade shows just like this one. And I started reading books and I got into every stocks, um, options, futures courses. And then I started trading them and I learned from my mistakes and I kept trading and trading and getting better and better. And eventually I went back to school and I got my MBA and I specialized in corporate finance and uh, the rest they say is, is history. But I know you're not here to listen to me talk about me so I'm uh, going to talk about investing in the future. 
But before we get too far into the future, I want to actually go back in time a little bit. So I want to go back to the year 1992. And 1992 was a full two years before the infamous Katie Couric quote on the Today Show. Remember when she turned to the cameras and said, what is internet? Well, a book called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson came out two years uh, before that, sold a modest 125,000 copies, but it introduced a concept that would ultimately become the future of the internet. Which is weird, right? Two years before America was even asking what is the internet, this book was talking about the future of the internet. And little did that author know at the time that that book would go on and appear on some of the top books to read lists for some of the pretty influential tech names. I don't know if you guys have heard of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, right? This book is listed on their top books to read. And even venture capitalist Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures said, a lot of what we invest in today and how we look at the future comes from this book. And it doesn't stop there. This book would actually go on to influence the film and gaming industries. This book introduced a concept that would inspire video games like World of Warcraft, if you're familiar with that one. It's pretty big. It's a global game. It also influenced movies like Free Guy, but perhaps the best example of this concept we're here to talk about today was actually brought to life in the film Ready Player One. This book is so influential, one of the largest companies in the world pivoted their business model and even changed their corporate name to match the concept that we're gonna talk about here today. So, what does Snow Crash have in common with the other things that I mentioned? Does anybody know? So Snow Crash predicted the concept of the metaverse. It's actually the first one, first book that attributed um, the concept of the metaverse. In, in the novel, people use digital avatars of themselves to explore an online world as their escape from their dystopian reality. So what is the metaverse exactly? Let's take a look at the word meta. So when we're speaking about a creative work, meta refers to itself or the conventions of its own genre. So in other words, it's self-referential. So the metaverse in this case is referring to a digital universe. So we have our physical universe that we all live in right now, but the metaverse is just a digital universe. And that, that leads people to often think that it's only a gaming thing, um, but really the metaverse is a digital universe where people can go to work and they can socialize with other people, they can explore, they can learn, they have art galleries that you can go um, view digital artwork. You know, you can live a digital life in this digital universe. So imagine everything that you can do in a physical world but imagine that and what you can accomplish or experience in a digital world without the physical barriers. I mean, you could visit all of the major landmarks in the entire globe in the matter of hours versus having to fly to all of these different places. It's pretty cool. So when I say a digital universe, what I'm actually really talking about is multiple digital worlds. So the metaverse, it's a universe consisting of digital worlds, that's really defined as persistent virtual worlds that continue to exist, even if you're not in them. So similar to our physical world, everything continues to exist or move or grow or change, whether you're an active participant or if you're just unplugged and on vacation. So if you think about the internet or social media as it exists today, the internet continues to exist and continues to move, even if we have our computers turned off or if we're going to go trade, you know, the internet still exists. And same thing with social media. We see celebrities always turning off their social media accounts as if that's going to do anything. But guess what? Social media continues to happen, even if they take a break. So I know I said the metaverse isn't just about gaming. Um, but if you're familiar with some of the video games on this list, you can make an argument that NBA 2K or Fortnite or World of Warcraft 
those are all examples of a metaverse that actually already exist. In each of those games, you create a player and you participate in a digital universe with other players from around our physical world. So even if you don't turn the game on at your house for a day or a week or a month, it doesn't really matter. The game continues for all of those other players. I mean, we've come such a long way from Mario Brothers when I started playing video games. And, you know, that game ends, it starts and ends when you turn on the gaming console. But when you turn it off, Mario and the princess are frozen in time. These other games are not like that. I mean, they continue even if you step away for a few hours. And then we have Decentraland, we have Sandbox and Horizon World. Those are all examples of metaverses, metaverses, metaverse I, I don't know, that's, uh, that's more than just a video game. You know, those are places where people can create a digital avatar, you know, that's a digital representation of themselves. They can go work, they can go live a life, they can go play, they can interact, they can learn. Um, but we're going to get to all of that in just a little bit. So for simplicity's sake, let's just say that the metaverse is the updated future version of cyberspace. Right now, you interact with cyberspace using two-dimensional programs. Let's say your social media site. You go on to Facebook, you post comments or Instagram, you post comments, you interact with one another, you can create, share, and watch content, and that's all fine and good. But in the metaverse, or the updated version of cyberspace, what we're really talking about is existing within cyberspace, within three dimensions. You can, um, you know, you can conduct business by being virtually together. So, uh, Meta Holdings, the company formerly known as Facebook, they have something called Horizon Workrooms, and that's a place where teams can get together virtually and go through their workday, and they can share their screens, and they can collaborate just as if they were all together. <clears throat> so, I mean, that has worldwide global implications when you can have a global team all get together in a room and, and participate together. <clears throat> you can create a home in Sandbox or Decentraland, and you can pay for digital entertainment. You can experience learning in an immersive atmosphere and be a part of the games that you're playing. So if you want to feel like you're in the cockpit of an F1 race car, right, you can do that. Um, or what if we could go back and relive and experience some key parts in history as if we were really there, and we were really interacting with the people that were there. So I mentioned Ready Player One before. I don't know how many people have seen that one. Has anyone seen that? So the film does a fantastic job of setting up the concept of a unified metaverse. And this is where people use virtual reality headsets and they can avoid their dystopian physical world, but they get out to work and play and interact and use their digital avatars, which they're digital representations of themselves to do all the things that they want to do. But I understand this is an investing conference. And so we want to know how we can profit off of this. We want to know, you know where the money is going. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next couple of minutes and we're going to look at the technology that is being used today and some of the use cases that will ultimately help build out the metaverse. So the first tool here, when we're talking about the, the future of investing and we're talking about what is needed for the metaverse, the first tool is really augmented reality. And that's the concept of overlaying digital information over your physical environment. So this is done by using artificial intelligence and camera sensors. So for example, home improvement companies are using augmented reality to show you what, let's say a new color of paint would look like in your, on your wall or what new flooring would look like or what your furniture would look like. That's that picture kind of in the upper left-hand corner there. So you simply hold up your camera and the camera sensors and the AI within that app overlay that new color on your wall. 
And this helps drive sales and it helps reduce items that are sent back for returns. I mean, think of it, you move into a house, you have a blank space and with augmented reality, you can plan out your entire space with furniture, flooring, color details. You can actually then print that out and hand it off to, um, you know, to, to a construction worker and say, hey, this is exactly what I want. And they can do that for you. Moving on from there, we have Mercedes. They launched an augmented reality navigation system. That's that sort of picture in the uh, upper right-hand corner. It creates a view of the road on your central touchscreen display, and it overlays the images that uh, are vital for navigate that have vital navigation information. There are automotive companies like Ford Motor Company, and that's they're looking to take that even one step further. They want to patent a special type of windshield glass so that the entire windshield can display various aspects of information that a driver might find relevant. I don't know, do you guys think that would be distracting or do you think that's, that's a good thing? Um, all right, so then we have manufacturing companies and manufacturing companies can use augmented reality and sensors throughout the warehouse to show what pallets are ready to go or what's the most efficient way to pick up or drop off items, which aisle they should go into, you know, and so on. And so while all of these pictures or most of these pictures are showing, you know, a camera on a phone or a tablet, all of this is soon going to be replaced with some type of eyewear. If you remember a couple of years ago, we had that sort of intro where we had Google, Google Glass for a little bit. But in theory, as technology improves, every screen that has access to sensors and a camera can be used for augmented reality so that you don't have to have a tablet or a camera and hold it in the air. I mean, you could just be walking down the, these aisles and have that, you know, in a contact lens or in your glasses that you're wearing. So the next tool in the tool belt really is virtual reality. And virtual reality involves building out this simulated environment that effectively tricks your brain into believing that you're somewhere where you're not, right? So virtual reality involves using a headset that the user has to wear and it transports them into this virtual world. The artificial environment though needs to be created and similar to the real world. And that environment in visual perspective changes with the movement of the headset. So that means creating an immersive 360 degree environment that change perspective as you turn your head. I mean, that's it's in, absolutely incredible and it's being built today. But you can also interact with this digital environment by using the, the uh, use of handheld controllers. But for VR to work effectively, the user has to feel immersed in their surroundings. So the environment that is generated needs to feel just as realistic uh, as the physical world to have that strong suspension of disbelief and to trick your brain. So the next generation VR, that's going to include haptic sensors, and that's going to allow the user not only to see the digital world, but to feel it as well. I mean, imagine if you're walking down a path in, you know, with a VR headset and you see a waterfall and you move your hand underneath the waterfall right now, it just feels like you're kind of moving your hand through air. But in the future, with haptic sensors and uh, or potentially even haptic suits, full body suits, you're going to actually be able to feel um, you're going to be able to feel that water coming through your hand, or at least a sensation of water you know, passing over. Um, so that's kind of the future of virtual reality. So here's some use cases. And uh, if you allow me to sidetrack for just a quick moment, um, you know, I'm not sure about you, but uh, as I get older, um, you know, I discovered that I can't really do roller coasters anymore. And it's not that I got dizzy, but it's because I hate the feeling of being confined by that lap and shoulder bar. So I guess as I got older, I became claustrophobic. I don't know. Um, but now I can still enjoy those those thrills, you know, by putting on a VR headset and watching point of view roller coaster videos. So I mean, it's one. 
And for sports, now imagine having always having the best seat in the house. So if you're a sports fan and you know you want to go to um, one of the largest football games around and you can't afford a seat, would you pay for a virtual seat to be able to sit on that 50 yard line? Or if you're like baseball, would you pay to sit at a virtual seat behind home plate? But the best part is if you are one of those people that's willing to pay and there are other people who are willing to pay, teams can then sell several best of seat, uh, best seat in the house tickets, right? It's no longer confined to a physical space where only one person gets that seat. Now you can sell it to 10,000 people if you want. I mean, just think about the money that could grow from just that alone. Virtual sporting events. What we're also seeing for virtual reality, which was something that I was a little surprised to see in some of my research, but um, nursing homes are now starting to incorporate VR. And what that's doing is it's giving people with mobility issues, an opportunity to travel and see things up close that they might not be able to see anymore. Um, and we've also seen VR used in rehabilitation centers too. So maybe someone who has recently uh, lost the use of a limb, you know, they're going into VR and they get to experience things um, that they may not be able to experience anymore. So when we're talking about augmented reality and virtual reality, I mean, really what we're talking about is technology of interaction with one another in three-dimensional space. So hopefully by now you can start to see and think about how all of these technologies can impact different industries. I mean, everything from factories to shopping, medical, real estate, I mean, those are just a few. And just recently, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, but um, Amazon released an augmented reality app that allows you to see what shoes look like on your feet before you buy them. And of course, they're coming out and saying, oh, this is going to be helpful for consumers and this is going to be great for them. But really what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce the returns and the costs associated with returns. But now think about this for a second. As Amazon creates and perfects their technology, their augmented reality technology, do you think that they might license that out for other people to use? Could they then help build out the metaverse, but without really just disrupting their current business model? I mean, that's just going to be extra money if they start licensing out this technology to other people. People in the medical profession are using virtual reality. Uh, they're using virtual reality games and controllers. And what they're doing is they're doing that, and these games simulate. Um, you know, even if it's just a matter of stacking blocks as a game, they're doing that to simulate the same muscle movements that you would have to do for certain surgeries. And that's building muscle memory and getting the surgeons that much better at um, some of these, these surgeries that they do. In real estate, I don't know how many people have bought a house recently, um, at least in the U.S., you know, it can be a, a pain, you know, um, you drive around from home to home on nights and weekends and the homeowner's not supposed to be there and then they are there or you drive 40 minutes away to see this house that looks really great on the pictures and then you take your first 10 feet into the house and you realize Ugh, this house is definitely not for me right i mean so right now that sure there are 3d models of homes um, that are being built but i mean what if you could experience the home using virtual reality? What if you could walk in the home? Especially like I was saying with those haptic suits, what if you could, you know, feel the counter space, whatever it is, open the doors, you know, walk through the home, right? That's all coming. That's all big potential for the technology of interaction. And so while these tools are all needed for the metaverse, you can there's plenty of needs that are being filled right now, like I said, with factories and shopping and everything else. So that's only going to improve the quality of the metaverse as these things are happening right now. So the metaverse is going to be built from a few key segments, and those are going to include content and consumer technology, infrastructure, and payment services. And we're going to break that down a little bit further on the next slide. But just think 
I just want you to start thinking about how many different market sect sectors and how many different companies are involved in content generation. How many different companies are involved in consumer technology and the hardware that needs to be built and the software that needs to be built for consumer technology? How many different payment services plans are there? And those all work in the physical world, but now we're asking these payment services to work in a digital universe and not just a digital universe, multiple digital worlds. And those all have to be seamless payment services. And then the infrastructure, what are the companies that are building this amount of stuff to build the metaverse? So we take those, those market segments and we kind of break those down even further. And so we're talking about seven key areas. And with content, you know, yes, that includes gaming, that includes virtual goods. You may have seen NFTs really taking off in the last couple of years. Um, we see design and creation, right? I talked about virtual reality and being able to move your head and have a 360 degree experience that changes perspective. Someone has to create all of that. Someone also has to create your, uh, your virtual identity. There's companies like Nike who are saying, hey, if you're gonna have a, a virtual identity, we wanna make sure that you look good. So we're gonna you know, give you Nike shoes, Nike shirts and everything so that you look good as a digital avatar. So that's all content that needs to be created by content creators. What tools are the content creators going to use? And those content creators also need infrastructure. Those content creators also need payment services. Those content creators need all those other things. So they all start forming together and fitting in together. Networking is gonna be paramount. I mean, we're talking about interacting with 3D environments all in real time. So we've seen vast improvements with 5G but we're going to have millions of people interacting with 3D environments. And, you know, we talked about navigation and augmented reality navigation. I mean, so even if you're driving across the country in a spot where maybe the internet's not so good, I mean, we still have to be able to deliver that same type of experience. Payments, digital payments that have to be used across multiple environments, multiple worlds, multiple digital worlds. So I see the rise of cryptocurrency, I know cryptocurrency in the last couple of months, you know, has had a little bit of a slide. I understand that. Um, but I really think that we're going to have a universal payment system using uh, cryptocurrency. And that's going to give it a legitimate use case then to have a massive adoption in the future. The metaverse is also going to require computing power to the level that we have not even seen before. I'm not even sure that we even know what it's going to be like. So that's going to require advanced chips to power these computers and power these headsets. And then we're talking about server power. I mean, the having hosting 3D environments for millions of users, I mean, that is going to just crunch on uh, servers. And of course, there's the hardware of VR goggles or AR cameras or AR sensors in the servers. And then where are these servers going to be located? So we're looking at real estate, you know, of where all this is going to be. So hardware and really involves any of the physical technologies, the haptic suits, the haptic gloves, any of those types of things that we need to, to work with, um, with the metaverse. And then blockchain, you know, right now there's kind of a decentral um, decentralized version of the metaverse and then you have um, meta holdings and that's more of a you know centralized version of metaverse um, you know with blockchain the the people get to handle governance and standards and protocols and it um, you know it, it's it's more in the hands of the public versus meta holdings you know that's one company controlling everything uh, and then security, we have cybersecurity at an, at an enterprise level. I mean, the more and more that we experience the digital world, the more uh, we're at threat for different cybersecurity issues. So I hope by now um, that you understand for all the reasons that I mentioned, we are of the opinion at Traders Reserve that the metaverse has the potential to create an $8 trillion, I mean, that's trillion with a T. I mean, the, the semiconductor market right now is about 600 billion, I think. We were talking about creating an $8 trillion market as this will impact several industries at a complete global scale. 
real estate, social media, games, gaming industry, um, also government policy. I mean, this is this is all new for governments around the world, and they're going to have to figure out where they fit into all of this. Media, travel, um, this is going to completely change the game for training, for engineering, being able to build out 3D models in a virtual space before you actually go to the site and start building a building or um, this has to do with robotics. I mean, everything. So this is not something just with a limited avenue of potential. I mean, this is the ability to create your own planet and everything that's involved in the planet. I mean, the only limitation that we have right now is just what our imaginations can dream up. And that's the amazing part of it. I mean, that's the global scale of this. So I understand, you know, I've done this presentation a couple of times before. I know that I may have lost some people. You may be thinking there is no way that people are going to spend time and spend money on a digital universe. We have a fantastic physical universe right here. Um, I know some of you been, you know, might say, hey, the pandemic has taught us one thing, and that is people are so tired of Zoom meetings and constantly being digitally monitored. So I, I completely understand where you guys are coming from, okay? But I want to take a look and I kind of want to show you some key stats because from an investment perspective, it doesn't really matter if you believe in it. What we want to see is, is there really value in this concept and can we profit off of it? And so in the case of the metaverse, really, this is going to be one of those situations where if you build it, they will come. I mean, Steve Jobs didn't ask what people wanted in a cell phone. He just built the iPhone and then he showed people what they wanted. I mean, no one knew what they wanted they was they were fine with just a little phone with some buttons until the iphone came out and it revolutionized how we see cell phones today and i see similarities in the metaverse so there are companies now who have solid business plans that are investing in the metaverse but eventually this is just going to become a new revenue stream for them so you build value by giving people a reason to go want to spend time in the metaverse if you create a job in the metaverse or you create digital art galleries that can only be seen in the metaverse where people can show off their artwork. Or maybe you have a unique concert or branded experience from some of your favorite companies. That's all going to drive people into the metaverse. And believe me, I used to work at an advertising agency. Advertisers are all over this. This is a big thing for them. So, there's something that's in limited supply and it can't be created easily in the physical world. And that is land and that helps create value. So the metaverse is no different. Decentraland decided to cap the parcels of land within their universe. They said, hey, yeah, we can build, we can keep building an infinite amount of space, but that's not gonna bring people to us. So they did the brilliant thing and they said, hey, we're only going to have 90,000 units of land. And if you want to be part of this, you have to go buy this land. And that's whether it's advertisers or, or people. And this has been generating revenue. So as the digital world creates contents and environment where people want to go and spend time, you get value. You have a limited space to buy in Decentraland. And so then a celebrity buys land. And guess what? Then other people start saying, hey, wait, I want to go buy that land too. So Snoop Dogg, you know, he bought land in the metaverse. And I kid you not, someone spent 630,000 real dollars to go buy a digital home next to digital Snoop Dogg in the metaverse. So fear of missing out starts taking over and that's what you get. So in fact, the metaverse real estate sales topped $500 million. And actually earlier this year before the market had this little hiccup over the last couple of months, the digital real estate market was projected to double this year in 2022, right? This isn't something that we're talking about 10 years from now. We're talking about $500 million in digital real estate. And that was projected to double this year. So here's some other key stats, you know, as investors, we're trying to follow the money. We're trying to invest in companies that are building the future. So let's just keep going. Fortnite started off as a video game. I mentioned that at, uh, at the beginning of the presentation. 
And they started hosting digital concerts. And their first concert was hosted by the uh, uh, electronic dance music DJ Marshmallow. And that concert was attended by 10.7 million people. I'll just say that again, 10.7 million people. In the physical world, I think it was, um, I think it was Ariana Grande in 2021, I think had the, the best selling physical concert in the United States. Um, and I think it's so, I think she sold out to 100,000 people. Marshmallow goes and he goes on to Fortnite and he has a concert for 10.7 million people. I mean, imagine if you're an artist and you can perform in front of millions of people at once, and just how much cheaper that is going to be instead of putting on a world tour. I mean, sure, yes, you want to go experience the fans, you know, where they are and everything, but could this be an additional revenue stream for people? Travis Scott, who's a rapper, he went on and he topped that and he performed in front of 12 million plus people at Fortnite's next concert. All right, so then we have Roblox. They have a pet simulation game that has 1.6 million concurrent players, and it was visited over 20.4 billion times. So before you laugh at a pet simulation game that's getting 1.6 concurrent 1.6 million concurrent players. I know some of you guys had pet rocks. All right, this is kind of the same thing, but in a digital universe. Microsoft continually posts more in cloud computing revenue. Um, we have the social media platform Snapchat that has 280 million daily, daily active users. And I highlight Snapchat because that is a platform that really makes use of augmented reality. And then Meta Holdings, of course, that's the company I was referring to in the beginning, you know, that uh, they're formerly known as Facebook. I mean, they're going all in on the metaverse. They even changed their name to Meta Holdings. And they're looking to sell 8 million VR headsets. And they're currently working on at least four new headsets to be released over the next couple of years, always trying to improve on um, the, you know, the sensors and, and the cameras and, uh, and quality of the lenses. So if you still have doubts, I understand, but remember, you don't have to see yourself using or even ever entering the metaverse. As an investor, since this is an investing conference, all you have to see is the value that this is creating. I mean, believe it or not, there are some people who still don't use social media, but does social media still impact the industries and the way that we live our lives? And is it still worth our money and worth investing in, even if we don't use it? So maybe some of you out there have invested in Facebook when for Facebook first came out, but you weren't using it. Or maybe some of you uh, are caught up in the Twitter mess that uh, Elon Musk has, has caused, even if you don't have a Twitter account. So this is the same thing. You don't have to believe in the metaverse. You don't have to believe that you're going to be spending 24 hours a day in VR goggles. But as investors, you can still see the impact that this is going to have on a global scale. We only care about value. We only care about finding the companies that continue to evolve, that continue to provide unique experiences to their users. So in Shanghai right now, uh, and this just came out, I think last week, the, you know, the plan is for them to build a business district worth $52 billion. I mean, they're investing $52 billion to build a metaverse cluster district in the city by the year 2025. I mean, it's what, halfway through 2022? I mean, 2025, that's three years away and they're investing $52 billion into this? The district is supposed to house 10 market leading enterprises in the metaverse industry. And then they want to house an additional 100 other companies that are metaverse adjacent. So those are the things that we talked about, those servers, the computer chips that are needed, all of those other things that maybe don't specifically have something to do with the metaverse, but are all needed to help build the metaverse. So what we're really talking about is Shanghai is spending $52 billion on metaverse infrastructure. This is the beginning of a long-term trend. South Korea just announced a $177 million deal dubbed the Digital New Deal. And that is supposed to help modernize 
their nation, including things like augmented reality. And Dubai, they're looking to introduce virtual reality government experiences. I mean, I thought that was crazy, but it's, it's so unique. And again, that means this trend, it's not a fad, this is coming. And we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but people are putting real money behind this and they're putting a lot of real money behind this. So when Traders Reserve co-founder, Mr. John Hutchinson, who was actually part of one of the Synergy Traders event uh, not too long ago, he asked me to research all of the influential companies who are building out the metaverse. And so I started looking at current market leaders and influencers. I wanted to find the companies that had a value proposition for the technology of the metaverse, but that were also working on other market segments. You know, I didn't want to put, I didn't want to find a company that had all of their eggs in one basket. So we wanted to find the companies that are building out the infrastructure because this is just the beginning. So I wanted to also find companies that had free cash flow that were able to adopt to a changing landscape. And you know, we've certainly seen in the last six months or so how the market can change and how growth stocks can fall out of favor in a heartbeat. So we looked at companies with solid earnings potential for you know, or those who had high operating profit margins. And if they had both, that was even a bonus. But we also wanted to find companies who are not just talking about the metaverse. You know, we didn't want to just like, oh yeah, the metaverse is a thing that we're gonna maybe do later on or whatever. You know, we didn't want to find companies that were going to get into it eventually. We wanted to find the companies who are investing in metaverse projects now. I mean, Google could make a virtual search library. I mean, if anyone remembers the 1994 movie Disclosure with Demi Moore and Michael Douglas, big pop culture fan, movie fan, whatever, um, you know, that had a virtual reality database. And I think it was called uh, the, the Corridor or the Corridor or something like that. Um, and Michael Douglas had to go find a unique password in this, you know, virtual reality database. I mean, think about what Google could do with virtual reality or a metaverse search engine. I mean, you know, I like flashy objects, so it's probably not really good for me because I think I'll just be stuck, you know, doing visual searches all day. So I want to present a, a case study. I mean, this is, a, you know, one of the companies that we found when we were doing our research and, and you know, um, and we kind of put this all together. And I think everyone knows about McDonald's. They make fast food hamburgers. They have worldwide franchises. Um, but you probably wouldn't really think of them as a metaverse play. I mean, you probably think I'm losing my mind right now. I mean, what, is, what would a meta Mac, Big Mac, even look like? I don't know. But um, let's just kind of go through McDonald's a little bit. They operated 39,000 restaurants. They franchised their business globally. They continue to evolve with self-ordering kiosks. They are collaborating with celebrities. I think you see that now with uh, Kid Cudi, who's working on app exclusive content uh, that you can only see if you're using their app. McDonald's is also piloting a loyalty program and they're working on an AI ordering system. So if you think about it, you know, it's like Siri or Alexa, but they're taking your McDonald's order. They also have AI in their drive-through ordering boards. So as you pull up to their drive-through, those boards can automatically change the location of the food, um, you know, the, the location of the menu items, depending on weather conditions or store location or the day of the week or whatever. I mean, they have all of this data about orders and they're now able to manipulate that. And it's really all about speed and, and upsells. Uh, the next item that they have on their mind, and this is, you know, kind of um, causing a little bit of controversy, but it's to store your order information by license plate and then share that with other stores in the network. So you could pull up to a McDonald's anywhere across the country and it would maybe pull up a previous order or at least prioritize the menu items based on what you've ordered in the past. And then you can combine that with the situation um, of current locations and weather and all that sort of stuff. So if 
you know, for example, you're traveling outside of your home community and it's hot outside, you know, maybe, and you pull up and they know that you've ordered, you know, slush drinks before, maybe they then prioritize that or have a little message as you pull up, they read your license plate, have a little message saying, hey, it's hot out, wouldn't you like a frozen slush drink? So I don't know how many people would want that, or maybe you guys think it's a, a privacy concern or a little creepy, I don't know. But the point is that they're evolving and the brand has been around for a while, but they're adapting to changing times. And so that's really check one on our list when we're looking for companies um, that could work in the metaverse. So let's go through some financials. So McDonald's has a forward PE, PE ratio that is less than their current PE ratio, meaning in theory, they are trading at a discount to forward earnings estimates. Operating margin is at 40%. And they also have a history of increasing earnings per share. I mean, I'm cutting a little slack on 2020, it's a pandemic year, but overall over the last couple of years, they have a history of growing their earnings per share. And they also have a history of growing their dividends. I mean, this is a company that I wanna be a part of. I mean, I'm not registered to give anyone else advice, but personally, this is a company that I wanna invest in. But here's an interesting part, and this is where McDonald's kind of comes into the metaverse. They actually filed patents to get into the virtual food and beverage sector. And I know, I know I'm not talking about digital hamburgers or, or Metamax. I'm not talking about making digital food for your digital avatar. I'm not sure how many people would buy that, but yeah, you never know. Maybe some people would. But what they're doing is they're expanding into the virtual in, uh, food and beverage sector um, by operating virtual restaurants within the metaverse. And what that would do is that would feature physical home delivery. So if you're in, if you're working in a, a metaverse or you're working in Horizon World, um, you could go to a virtual restaurant and um, nod your head or you know, blink your eyes or whatever. You could order the food and then, you know, through Uber or DoorDash or whatever, uh, or even McDonald's delivery, they deliver the physical food to your physical location. And so what this is really showing is that um, customers, it's showing that McDonald's can get into the metaverse by not really breaking away um, from what they know how to do already this they're not trying to get into some fad but they're exploring new paths they know what their brand is they know how uh, they know their product they know where the people are going and they're trying to get there as well and really what that's doing is they're one of the leaders showing other businesses and other brands how they can enter into the metaverse so what we've done at Traders Reserve is we've put all of this together and we made a small package specifically for the people at this event. And it's called the Traders Reserve Metaverse Research Package. Yeah, that is a mouthful. Um, but what you get is you're going to get the top five sectors to watch out for in the metaverse. You're going to get 30 different metaverse stocks to add to your portfolio, um, or at least that you should be paying attention to. You get fundamental analysis on each of the companies, similar to what I did with uh, McDonald's, but you know it goes through a little bit more detail. And the best part is, I know it's been a, a difficult six months or so in the market, um, especially you know for for people who are on the long side of things. Um, but the most of these companies that are in the metaverse uh, research, you know, they're trading at significant discounts to future earnings and certainly significant discounts to their prices where they were six months ago, if you believe that um, they can, you know, rise back up to, uh, to those prices. But all of these companies have one thing in common, and that is that they have existing revenue streams that are completely unrelated right now to the metaverse, but they're still market leaders in their segment. So imagine their potential when they get into this market, and if they can then start taking out part of that $8 trillion marketplace, I mean, these companies have the potential for absolute explosive growth. So as these companies grow and expand into the metaverse, they can grow their revenue exponentially. And that is why we think now is the best time to get in or at least be aware of these companies and start putting them on your watch list. Um, you're getting in right now in the early stages of everything, but not after it already happens. You don't want to be in when they already announced these things. You want to be in ahead of the game. 
So if you buy the metaverse package today, you're going to get my 24 page report uh, with full analysis on up to 30 different stocks. You can download the report. You have access to uh, it using the Traders Reserve app that's available for Android and Apple phones. Um, you get the metaverse analysis video that's going to be a replay of this webinar we're working on another bonus video that's going to happen a couple of months from now where we are going to update um and on metaverse news stories and what the companies are doing you're going to have uh, access to all of this on our private members website um and uh and i know i'm putting myself out here a little bit but how much do you guys think that um, that's going to be worth. How much would you pay for all of this? I mean, this is months of, of me putting out uh, lots of research. All right, well, this is all going for $7.95. And no, that is not a typo, um, although it could easily go for $795. Um, this is only $7.95 you get all of this stuff, the five core sectors of the metaverse, 30 stocks, detailed fundamental analysis for each company, a metaverse portfolio, um, or at least a portfolio of ideas. Uh, you get the, the video for review, video updates, access to everything through our Traders Reserve app and on the member site, all for a, uh, really, if you're in California, I mean, that that's what, less than a tank of gas, or uh, I'm broadcasting from Detroit. That's you know just about the cost of a cup of coffee here. So um, if you want this, the report, $7.95. Uh, if you like what you saw here today, um, go to go.tradersreserve.com slash metaverse and you get all of that. I think David's putting it in the chat. Um, Suzanne's putting it in the chat and uh, click on that and um, and that's it. I mean, that's 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 it. Uh, I just want to say thank you to David, the whole team, for inviting me. I hope this is a good way to kick off three days of exciting presentations. Um, for those who listened, I certainly hope that you guys learned something today. Um, and uh, and I'll I'll be listening to the rest of the speakers. You know, like I said, I'm a retail trader. I love this stuff, so I'll be listening along to everyone else. Um, and thank you to Suzanne who's putting that chat uh, or putting that link in, in the chat box. Um, and that's that's it. Uh, I guess I have time, David, for maybe a couple of questions, one or two questions, maybe. I'm not sure if I see questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, we have a few minutes left. Um, I don't know that I'm seeing anything. The chat might be acting weird. If you can hear me, type something in the chat if you can. Uh, I can hear you. Yeah, I yeah for the audience. Oh, I'm sorry, audience. Yes, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe no one has any questions. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Holy cow! Look at this yeah. crowd. So many people, so many people. Oh, looks like Chris has a question. Chris is raising their hand, but I can't. Chris. Yeah, you have to type Suzanne. Type the question in the chat if you have any questions. Paul has a question. Oh my gosh. I see hosts and panelists in the chat. Is there a different chat preview I should be looking at? No. Um... Um, I'll tell you what, if, if, if we can't get this figured out, I know I'm kind of running into time here. Um, if you guys, if you don't mind, send a, a uh, my team's probably going to hate me for this, but you can always send me an email at support at tradersreserve.com. Um, and I've got uh, uh, Mike and Leslie, they are, they'll, they'll make sure that I get any of your questions um, if, if we can't get this working. Yes, thank you, Suzanne, for putting that in. Support, tradersreserve.com. Um, they do forward all the questions to me, so you will get an answer directly from me. Um, but if there's anything I can do uh, or, or ask, um, answer any of your questions, please just uh, email them since I, I can't see your chats. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for spending time. I know it's a busy trading day. Um, okay. I just. For some reason now the chat is disabled. I just logged into a separate. I... Okay. 
Um, sorry about that. I, I'm not sure what's happening. I definitely okay. did not disable it. <laughs> we may have, may have crossed into the metaverse. Yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, maybe know. in one of these uh, future events, we'll be doing this in the metaverse, right? So that, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, all the people who are raising the, their hands um, in, in the participant window in Zoom, please just uh, support at tradersreserve.com. Uh, happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and I do I do want to keep this rolling along. And uh, so so thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, and have a great day. All right. Thank you, Jeff.